This is episode 32 of A Nap is Mighty Energizing, the podcast. Named in honor of the nap I took between some of these episodes because I was so tired. I don't really find naps energizing. I feel like I just wake up more tired than I was before. What you have to do is you you nap for an hour, and then when your alarm goes off, you just get up, then go back to what you're doing, and then you'll find you have more energy. Of course, right when you wake up and you're still in bed, you don't want to get up. But if you do, they they are energizing. They're empowering even. See, that's the key. I'm not getting up. I'm just sleeping for nine hours. That's a, that's, that's a problem. Yeah, it probably is. If your naps are, are nine-hour marathons, that's an issue. But it's not a problem for psychic people, which is a great segue into talking about our first show. Uh, that might have been a great segue if being psychic had anything to do with napping. Well, they woke up the sleeping daughter two episodes ago, so it had to do with napping. Was she sleeping in there? Yeah. Okay. No. Yes, and then no. It doesn't matter. Let's talk about Mob Psycho 100, Episode 6. Are, are we going to talk about it? Yeah, we are. Sorry, I was taking a drink. Okay. In Guess what? this episode. Mob uh, went, he finally went back to school. I was worried he was. I was worried he was going to be truant. You know, like he had... We weren't seeing him in school at all. Was he was he skipping? Was he was he going over the dark side? No. <laughs> Is it because they didn't light the whole scene? No. He he went back. And it was awesome. It was. Although I feel like this show, the episode focused a lot more on Reagan than it did on Mob. Yeah, it did. Because at a certain point Mob decides, I've had enough of your shit. And then he uh, he disappears for a while, and we get uh, a close up, like you know, a thorough examination of Reagan's pitiful life. Yep, and we also see um, how he started. Yeah, there's a flashback. I didn't realize Reagan was 28. That's how old I am. And he's got his own business, and now he's on TV. Yeah, <laughs> I got a lot to live up to, man. I do get more than zero um, birthday wishes. On my birthday, though. That's true. Or but that's probably go. because you're not using friend book. You're using face friend. I am, I am using face friend, but I don't have my birthday on there. Um, nice. A, few, uh, a handful of people remember that it's my birthday. That's enough for me. As long as it's not zero. As long as it's more than me. That's, uh, that's what really makes my soul come alive is when I get random posts about hey happy birthday i haven't spoken to you in seven years well but happy birthday to be fair i mean think how much reagan would have appreciated a message like that when he logs on to face friend or whatever the knockoff is called on the show and, friend book. and he and he, sa- he sees that he has zero um you know birthday well wishes he, yeah, that's, he would have, that's pretty soul crushing. He would have appreciated some random dude that he hadn't heard from in seven years who he didn't really care about just saying, you know, hey, have a happy birthday, man. But he didn't really appreciate the uh, the people that don't really care about him or that do seem to down at the bar. Or the Ponzi scheme people? Yeah, the people who were easy to fall for Ponzi schemes well, and uh, multi-level marketing. I mean, he looks down on them. So... But at the same time, he also appreciated, or at least used to, the fact that they, like, revered him and sought his wisdom in issues. He was always just looking to use them somehow or to manipulate them the same way he does with Mob. And in this episode, like, his, just the level of cunning that went into his, you know, attempted manipulation of Mob really reminded me more of what we saw last season. Because in, in previous episodes this season, he's been thinking to himself, you know, um, oh, Mob is feeling such an, like this way uh, in this situation. I, re- I should ask him what's up with that later. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, I remember. That, that Reagan didn't seem to be present in this episode. He was more like, oh, you don't have any friends you don't have any anything to do. Just, they don't actually care about you. Just come by and help me with my work. Me, me, me. 
I can't use any of my power, so uh, how about you do it for me? I was just surprised to see that version of Reagan reappear, I think. Or maybe reappear so quickly. Yeah, I guess. I mean, he's always he's always been that kind of shady string puller. Yeah, that's that's true, but I would have expected that transition to come a little slower rather than being like, Man, I really care about Mob's well being this episode. Next episode, pff, you don't have any friends. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I sometimes when I watch this series, I get the feeling that they're um compressing things quite a bit. Because word on the street is that there isn't going to be any more mob psycho after this. Like the the manga's finished, as far as I understand, and there's not going to be any more anime. Like this is it. Huh. Um so they're probably just trying to cram everything in there that they can. Which which may be why they kind of smushed all the school stuff into this one episode. Because I I don't know I I kind of feel as though him going out to a family restaurant with all the guys from the body improvement and telepathy club, and then going to karaoke, and then uh, just like breaking his record for the amount of push ups he can do in in one set. You know that all that seems to be. I mean maybe it's just because I love all the school related stuff so much, but a lot of that seemed to be kind of dumped into this episode, like funneled into it. It's almost like they didn't have the rhythm to pace it. Well done. Thank you. I, I'm kind of ashamed of that. Uh, for any of you who are wondering why that was so terrible, I guess that was a pun. You would call it a pun because mob has no rhythm. In yes, the karaoke scene. That was the, when he's hitting the, the tambourine, He's way off tempo. Yes. But, and he wasn't having fun either. I I thought that uh, in, in that scene, he might realize, wait a minute, I'm not really having any fun. I like, I should go back to Reagan because that's where I really have fun is doing spirit stuff. So I'm glad that uh, that was avoided. You know, that's not what we saw. He was kind of just like, I don't really understand this, but. I'm doing stuff. Was that just mob being kind of out of touch or out of sync with everybody else? I think so. Just in general. But also just be like, I've never done this before. What's happening? I'm just hitting this thing while right. flashing lights and loud music blare in the background. Yeah. he per- Perhaps he doesn't understand the appeal. Oh, another thing that he did in this episode, he played video games with his brother. Yeah. That was kind of fun. Because he... He's always home really late, I guess, because of all the psychic expeditions that he goes on for his part-time job. Yeah. We get to get a little little bonding time with Ritsu, I think is his brother's name. Yeah. Um, so that, you know, that was nice. But yeah, the, the episode was more more about Reagan, who is 28. <laughs> Reagan's transformation, starting to accept every type of job. Dude, did you think that he was going to turn into like some kind of evil spirit or something at any point throughout the episode? I thought a little bit. Like when he was outside in the alleyway puking after drinking non-alcoholic drinks yeah. at a bar. One non-alcoholic One. drink. Yeah, he was throwing up. A because, lemon sour with extra sour. Right. I he, loved the bartender. The, his, with the his, butt chin? Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of characters in this in this series who have butt chins. I thought during that scene, I thought just because of how uh, moody the lighting was and how he was like, his, you know, his eyes were wide and he was, he was throwing up and he was just contemplating the fact that he really didn't have any sort of social life or he hadn't made any friendships uh, over the last, you know, four years or however long. I thought he was, gonna, you know, some kind of evil spirit was going to emerge from from his from that dark place and mob was going to have to defeat it and you know they would be back together as the as the golden golden couple but and then Reagan's just like uh, nope reinvent myself which is basically to say do the exact same thing but more <laughs> yeah well not the exact same thing because he becomes a gamer <laughs> <laughs> gamers rise yeah, up an epic one in fact with multiple accounts and doesn't sleep for weeks. Yeah. I mean, I, I, it was kind of strange to me that he was able to dig even deeper, like when he was in that totally desolate uh, frame of mind where he's like, nobody cares about me. 
Um, my my life is totally empty. My best friend is a is a middle school boy who has uh, you know left me for dead, occupationally speaking. And then he somehow he's able to dig even deeper into some like reserve of positivity that he had tucked away. And like I I thought that was a little strange. The only person who cares about me is me, so I should start actually caring about me. Uh, I don't really feel as though that that angle was taken by the series. He's right, but Reagan is is has kind of been characterized as like an enigma, you know, like um, when he's when he's in a stressful situation. Take for example all the stuff with Claw in season one. He kind of just storms in there, you know, and with with no psychic powers to speak of, and no preparation, he, and he takes control of this, the situation. Just um, with his gigantic personality, charisma one hundred. Yeah, what did what did, what went to hundred in this episode? His popularity. Yeah, popularity, popularity went to hundred. That's how he got the TV appearance, which isn't actually what happened. Right. The what's his face got the TV appearance. Yeah, it's um, I wrote it down here. Jodo Kirin. That's right. Yeah, he. That's the guy who he uh, who he need. Who he flying flying knee exorcism. Right. Um, so I guess we'll, we'll find out what happens with that next week. I also thought it was really interesting how, uh, so, you know, Reagan tries to manipulate mob into getting him to help him more and kind of shirk off his, his friends or social life that he thinks doesn't exist. And then he finds yeah. out it does. Yeah. He sees in person on the street yeah, and then that he mob hides. is hanging out with a couple of his friends. Yeah, that's a Dimple, really that's a really pitiful scene. And Dimple comes up to him and he tries to coerce Dimple into following Reagan around rather than Mob as being like you'll never he'll never use his powers and you'll never be able to get control of him and just tries to like play on the darker aspects of Dimple's character and Dimple's like yeah, peace, bro. And even he who is like, you know, Dimble, who is very self-serving, is just like, dude, you're kind of nuts right now, and just goes and follows Mob. Well, Reagan has no psychic abilities. Right, There's nothing in it for Dimple to, to hang around him. Dimple has pulled latent psychic abilities out of... Out of Reagan? Reagan before, yeah. Oh, okay. What, in season one? Yeah. Okay. But not, not much. Yeah. Compared to Mob. He doesn't have the the power that Dimple really lusts after. So he's still, he's like, have fun being with a middle schooler who will just have a normal life and you'll never get to do anything. And Dimple's like, all right, peace, bro. Yeah. So I thought that was interesting to see Dimple's character kind of not be as self-serving as usual and trying to like, because essentially Reagan wants Dimple to convince Mob for him. Yeah, pretty much. And Dimple's just like, nah. Nah, bro. <laughs> so I thought that was interesting. Yeah. I do wonder um, if this is the last Mob Psycho anime adaptation that we ever get, when Dimple's like breakaway moment will be. If he just decides, or if he'll just decide, you know, I'm, I'm a good guy now. Or I'm I'm friends with Mob now, or if we'll you know we'll we'll have Mob might have to put him down somehow or something, because he has remained you know lustful for power, but he's done a couple you know nice things at the same time. Right, that's why I'm saying if we have only six episodes left to go, I wonder how that'll be handled, because he hasn't made a complete transition to the to the. The, the dark the side, the light side. Yeah, that will uh, that will be interesting for sure to see if they do anything with that or not. Speaking of doing anything or not, how about we talk about Neverland? Doing anything or not? Okay. It's suppo- they're supposed to be terrible transitions. I'm channeling Linus Sebastian today. I don't know what that means, but we can talk about the promised Neverland if you like. I'm gonna scroll down here. I wrote hardly anything about this series. This episode or this series in general? Well, this episode, yeah. Um, the first half of it was just a conversation. Yeah. 
And then second half of it was just a conversation. This uh, this this show is the one that made me really sleepy, so I had to take a nap. Um, but I don't know. I don't feel like it was terrible. Uh, this this anime might be like you know Death Note for for the kids. Kind of. I I don't know. <laughs> I don't. No, because that's what Death Note is. Yeah, but I, I I don't know. I mean, like the whole conversation between Norman and Ray just kind of reminds me of the the sort the sort of repartee that you would get between um, Light and L, right? Uh, in Death Note, you know the where they both kind of understand who the other one is, um, but they're still cooperating with each other, and they're they're like edging closer and closer to totally outwitting the other one at least in their minds um because you know we he it was actually a triple trap not a double trap as we suspected last week he so he nailed norman nails ray and says i got you because the rope wasn't actually i you know something right. something about the rope's location yeah i knew that <laughs> um and you know then then ray spills all of his secrets or does he you know, it's kind of like a giant, big old mind game. So this is for for like a younger audience. This might be like really, really crazy and tense. It's like they're it's it, like, they're it's they're like, trying to be like, "Yo, look at this 4D chess," and they're actually just yeah. playing checkers. I I don't know. I was I was kind of interested in their whole big long conversation because I'm not like I'm not against um really really wordy scripts on you know. In principle, that's, I'm not against, that's fine. I'm but. not against wordy scripts either, or you know, lengthy dialogue. You know, some of my favorite movies are almost entirely dialogue, um, oh. like Fincher. What? Fincher's movies aren't all dialogue. Excuse me, Sorkin. Fincher okay. was the director of The Social Network. Yeah, that's true. But there's still a really important visual component to all of Fincher's films. Right, but in this, I just felt like it's, it's like you're the traitor. Yes, I am, but I'm actually a double traitor. Oh, he's going to become a double traitor. That's what Norman wants from him, and no, that's what Ray he, agrees to. Because he already said he's like, I did this so that we could get out. Right, but he also agrees. Uh, he kind of says to Norman, "It'll, you know, I'll allow you to manipulate me." I don't know if that particular line was in the the Crunchy Subs. Um. But did you did you understand him to kind of be offering him offering himself as a tool for Norman to use against Mama? Right. I mean, he yeah. did because that was his intention. So he's going along. So he's going to become a, an actual double agent as opposed to just playing both sides for himself. Um. But at the same time, but he's he he's a his... triple traitor because he's got this deal struck up with Norman where. Uh, he wants Norman to allow, like, to He's say like, fuck all the other kids. Yeah, and when he when he speak when Ray speaks to Emma, he says, "Oh no, we're going to save them all." So he's he's playing both of them. You know, he's presenting two different versions of himself to each of them. So you know, right, but he's really only playing Emma because he told Norman he's like, "Yo, we're going to trick Emma." Right, but so he's only playing two people. No, here. that that's the thing. Um. He could he could be lying to Norman as well. He could, you know? yes. He's in the he's in the theme song. You know, he's in the OP running alongside the two other kids escaping, and then they bust through the little puzzle wall. Um, you know, the, and they're all like looking real happy about their accomplishments and the, like their best friends and stuff. So, yeah, perhaps it is as simple as he's been found out, and now they're all going to work together and shit. I don't but, think they're going to pull like any more crazy curveballs. Like, I'd just be like, oh, I was a secret agent for the double space force the whole time or something like that. You know, they're just going to it's going to be all right. Here's all the cards. Let's you play, really let's play the rest of solitaire. You really think that all, you know, we've learned everything there is to learn about these characters. I think so. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know about that. I mean, when do you think they're going to escape? That's because there was some discussion of that in this episode as well. And I think something you pointed out last week was that 
um, a little bit of evidence for Ray actually being the mole was that he was so taken aback and so against the time escaping. frame change. Yeah, Norman wanted to change the time frame. Yeah, so which he specifically Norman, mentioned. Norman points that out in this episode. That's you know that's why you didn't want to, us to escape in eight days or ten days, whatever it was. So I can't remember whether they reached any sort of uh, resolution on that front. They didn't. Okay. Now, when do you think they're going to escape? According to Norman's schedule or Ray's? Because Ray is offering himself as like a, a source of really vital information. Um, so he might know when the best time to escape is. So do you think they're going to follow his plan at this point? Or is Norman the more powerful one in their relationship? And he's, because he knows that Ray is the mole. Well, so does Emma now. Yeah, I, I kind of feel as though Ray still has all the cards. Not, uh, not, using the card metaphor to explain how much information is being given to the viewer, but using it to describe who has more power in the situation. Right. Cause he's the, he can just tell, he can tell mama, like they've, they know too much. It's gone too far. Just get them out of the picture. He has right. that option at any moment. Like he can, if he senses that something is going wrong or he's not confident in uh, Norman and Emma, he can totally back out and win Mama over completely because she still doesn't trust him fully. Right, even though it's been six years. Yeah. He can win her trust completely and, you know, maintain his safety, hopefully, um, by selling them out one last time. So it's really him who, who uh, you know, is holding the ace, so to speak. Yeah, that's that's true. But I don't know how many more like twists or turns we're really going to get out of this show. So then you must think that there, the escape attempt is going to happen soon, right? Because if there's no, if there are no more fast ones to pull, no more curveballs to throw, then the only thing left to, for them to do is to try to get out. What episode number are we on? This was five. We're almost a week behind. Whenever we talk about this series, I think because I, I think, think new episodes come out on leave Thursday. Episode seven. They won't leave next episode, but they'll leave the one after. That's my guess. Okay. I don't really know when they're going to leave. I don't. Uh, we didn't see Sister Crone in this episode at all. Good. <laughs> she might throw a wrench in things somehow and prevent them from leaving for a while. I don't know. We also know, know why she's know. there. Why is that? Because uh, Norman, or uh, because Ray slipped up. Because he slipped up? Yeah, because he didn't stop people from going to the gate. Oh, yeah. And as he explains to Norman, he, he did that on purpose. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I do remember him apologizing about that to Mama. Not exactly. And he's like, you shouldn't have brought her. She's trying to bring you down. Like, you messed up. Hmm. Well, I, yeah. She, certainly her, you know, her ambition and her her hatred of Isabel will probably, and we it will probably, you know, cause her to throw some sort of wrench in the works. But the thing that just occurred to me is remember during the hide and seek scene, when she says to Emma, you know, if, if you've seen what I think you've seen about the demons, then I'm on your side. Remember when Emma was hiding with the two little children, yeah, in I that, remember in that, that desert looking area. We still don't know what she meant by that. Do we? Uh, well, I think we do a little bit more, now that we talked to, now that we saw her conversation with Gilda in the last episode, because she's like, if you just rat everyone else out, I'll make sure that you live. I see. So you think that she was just referring to the fact that she could keep Emma from being sold off to the demons? Yeah. That would be on your side? Yes. Okay. Well, I mean, hopefully her character doesn't exist just to be, you know, Creepy and Creepy weird. Creepy like a clown and mildly racist. Right. Um, yeah. I, I have to imagine that we did, if we didn't see her this week, then she'll play maybe a more significant role next week. Who do you think's behind the door at the end of the episode? Behind the door? Yeah, Don and Gilda are looking for the secret room. They're like, hey, don't go into this room. This is a bad idea. Don't go into this room. This is a bad idea. What are you doing, Don? I'm going into this room, even though it's a bad idea. Okay, remember how I said I had to take a nap after this episode? I totally, I mean, I wasn't asleep. I do sort of recall what you're talking about. 
I remember there was even a map, I think. Yeah, Emma uh, figured out like that a there was plan. a uh, that there's like a secret room right. somewhere next to or connected to Mama's office. Well, that secret room is probably where um where she goes to give her reports. That's literally what it is because they've mentioned it. Yeah. And then Don and um Don's like we need to go there so we can try to find out where Connie and all the others are. Right, because he was lied to about Connie's uh, And Ray is just like no. <laughs> don't. We don't know what it connects to and it's probably doesn't have the information we want anyways, so don't do it. So what happens at the very end of the episode? They're about to go into the secret room. They like they pull back the bookcase and they try to open oh, the door right. to the secret bookcase. room and it's locked and then the door opens. And I'm ninety nine percent certain it that it's just gonna be Ray. That you don't see who it is. Okay. And you don't hear like a voice or a footstep or something. There's no like tease as to who it is. Maybe it'll be Isabel. And those two will like get found out. I don't know. And they're in the they're in the OP. Be, who are? Don and Gilda. Yeah, but what I'm saying is maybe it'll be Mama and she'll be like, What are you guys doing here? And then they'll have to you know, keep this, keep the secret for the other three, even as they get confined to their rooms or something. And then we'll see, you know, some sort of cross examination, like Crone will be pressuring the two of them. And then Ray will be like, we got to escape now before they ride us out. And then. I think it's just going to be like Ray just being like, you guys are morons. I told you not to do this. Let's go. I think it's just going to be like a, okay, like a non cliffhanger. Gotcha. Just like last week's episode was, it's just like you're the imposter. Yep. Oh, oh. he he did deny oh. it at first. No, he didn't. Yes, he did. He said, "Are you sure?" And then Ray, and then Norman was just like, "Here's my reasoning." And then Ray just went, "Yeah, yeah, it's me." Yeah. Well, I, I don't know. I thought it was fine. I was kind of interested in the first half of the episode. I, you know, I got a little little bit of a a Death Note vibe, like I said earlier. It's not a bad thing. No, it's definitely not. Um, I just thought it was a little too, like, it's just like, I've been, I've been Mama's spy for six years. I knew exactly how to get rid of the tracking devices. I've been doing this for you guys the whole time. That's, I don't think, I don't know. I, I think that's fine. I don't feel as though that's any different than, uh, than L, you know, approaching light after their tennis game and saying, I'm pretty sure you're the killer. Just you know, laying it all out there. Right, but what if what if Light had just gone, "Yep, it's me," right that's, afterwards? That's that's not what I'm saying. Or I I understand what you're saying, but what happened immediately after in Neverland was Ray just went, "Yep, it's me." I I I think that's fine. I think there's probably more more um more information that we don't have access to yet. We'll see. All right, how, how about Kaguya-sama? We got relationship advice, volleyball, and umbrellas. Yeah, this was the first episode that I didn't love. Really? Yes. I um, really liked the volleyball uh, section. Huh. I think that was my favorite. The volleyball was my least favorite. Really? Yeah. I thought it was hilarious. It was, it was pretty funny. Um, but we already know that the president is... Um, he's like mostly an academic guy and he's, he's into studying. Like that's his whole, that's his whole thing. That's how he attained the, the presidency of the student council. Right. Um, it's just because he throws himself completely into, into studying and such. And we already know that he's a dork. He's like a, he's like a bit of a nerd. We already know that he's somewhat vain. So I don't think we any, we leaned anything new about his character. Um, I mean, that being said, it's, still kind of funny that he keeps hitting himself in the face when he or in the like the back of the head in the back I, of the head in the side of the face in the actual face yeah, yeah. uh when he's serving the volleyball and the uh, for me the the best part of that second segment was uh at the very end when fujiwara has like the bandages on her bow on her bow yeah and yeah, all that's over really her. cute um but that was just i like the other two more i guess okay so which of the three was your favorite I don't know. Um, maybe Fujiwara probably the third one. The third one, yeah. the uh, the umbrella. Yeah, just because like that that seemed to be the very traditional 
uh, Kaguya-sama chapter, I guess, where it's about something very simple, but the, then the two of them are are trying to outwit the other. And in the end, you realize, of course, that Kaguya has her level of planning is second to none. She's, you know, she hung the, I noticed in the subs that I was using, it didn't say Teru Teru Bozu dolls. Um, but in addition to her, like checking the weather report and checking the bike rack and blah, blah, blah. She also, she also made Teru Teru Bozu dolls, which are a Japanese, um, uh, I guess tradition where if you, if you want there to be uh, rain, you hang them upside down. And if you want the rain to go away and for there to be sun, you hang you hang them right side up. They're those little cloth things with the faces. And the, oh yeah, they look like little ghosts. I saw this. Um, that's what they're that's what they're called. So when she hung them upside down, that means she wanted it to rain. So you remember how like in past episodes we've seen her? Uh, oh, she caused the flat tire. That yeah. was part of that episode too. So in addition to causing the flat tire, so that she would, um, you know, so she, she wouldn't be driven to school. She also, quote unquote, causes it to rain by hanging those dolls upside down. Yeah, she just takes every variable out of the equation. Right. Except for Fujiwara. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I always like seeing that play out. I like that Kaguya's character is uh, like, she's totally cunning and uh, strategic, um, but she always overlooks one thing, whether it be Fujiwara or whether it be like her own ignorance of um, sexual phone, matters or how phones work. Right. Yeah. There's always, she always misses something, you know, which, which stops her character from being too like bratty or annoying or prideful or know it all. And it instead makes her, you know, like more human. Yeah. More human. That's a good word. So that was, that was my, I think that was my favorite section. Yeah. And then uh, what was the first one again? The first one was uh, Kaguya giving relationship advice to the girl who wanted right. to break up with her boyfriend. That Kashiwagi is the name of the girl. Right. That um, Shiragane had given relationship advice to. Yeah. Okay. Do you Wall slam. Go yeah. out with me. Do you remember after the end of the second episode, which is where um, the original relationship advice segment was from? It said on screen, like at the very end, before the credits, the next advice seeker. And then it was not Kashiwagi there, but her friend. It was Kashiwagi's friend who originally, like, had seemed so upset that the two of them got together. Right. Like, she actually liked the guy. Yeah, I remember that. And th then at the end of this episode, she's still, you still see her, like, peeking out from behind a wall. And she still, like, looks distraught about the fact that the two of them are still together. What... When is she going to actually be the advice maybe she, seeker? Maybe she's going to seek advice from uh, Shiragane. I mean, yeah, maybe. But I, I was just, uh, I was surprised that it was Kashiwagi who, who came to Kaguya like, what do I do? Because her, her, her friend was promised as the next person who was, was going to go through this. Sort you got to rage against society to grow closer together. Right. Everyone has a common enemy, and that is society. This corrupt society and billionaires, right? Yeah, her her advice is not too good. She also inadvertently teaches Kaguya to equate jealousy with attraction when she, you know, takes them through the mental exercise of, oh, you know, picture the person that you like. Uh, what did she say? Like kissing or, someone else, or just with someone else, yeah. or something like that. Uh, and of course, Kaguya pictures Shiragane with. Fujiwara. Yeah. So she, by, by taking her through those steps, I guess she, she teaches Kaguya that, oh, that's how, you know, you, when you like someone, when you feel possessive of them, perhaps not the greatest lesson to teach to, uh, I mean, you know, an impressionable teenage girl, but whatever. That's, but she is a, an impressionable teenage girl. So that's how she's going to think. So well, that's the lesson she she's will, teach she to will else. now that Fujiwara said so. Right. But she doesn't know anything about romance or love, so... Right, and neither does Fujiwara, apparently, if that's the advice she's giving. Uh, I guess. I do remember that uh, in the previous episode, with you remember the band word game, where they all hold up the right. words I can't say? Fujiwara um, says, like, I, you know, I... It makes me really sad when people say that I can't read the mood or the situation and they don't involve me in their, their, uh, their romantic talk um 
Now she says all that in order to get Kaguya to say the word love. Right. Um, but that's still something that she, apparently she really wants to be a part of, which is why she like barges in on their conversation. She's like, I had to go run down Sherlock to the cap. props department to grab this hat. Yeah. And her pipe. Um, so I, I guess it's nice for her that she got to involve herself in that a little bit. That seems to be her favorite thing. Even in the volleyball segment, she suspects that the president wants to look good for a girl, which is why he's doing all that training. Right, and he won't uh, say. Right, and she's like, tell me, tell me. So that's, of course, you know, she's always ruining Kaguya's plans and getting in the way of the Shiragane and Kaguya potentially, you know, getting together or reaching the end of one of their little games that they're playing with each other. Um, but she she doesn't realize it. So even though she likes to be involved in the the romance side of things so much, she's also an obstacle to that that very that very thing. Well, of course, right? It's all it's all set up to perfection. It's got the third wheel. Mm -hmm. Uh, what else? Is there is there anything? I don't anything else. I don't think so. I mean, we did see at the end of the the first segment, um, they see uh, the guy and the girl doing charity work. Yeah. Um, and then it turns out that Shiragane is there helping them. It was just like, yeah, right. I volunteered to help do this. So I forget why exactly he did that. Um, but whatever. He said something like profound. You know? Did he? Yeah. I kind of I kind of feel the opposite. I kind of feel as though. Uh, he explained it away like very quickly, and but nevertheless, Kaguya was like, "That's what I love about you." Result: Kaguya loses. Why did she lose? I don't know. Because she was just like, "Now I like the president more." Yeah, because she acknowledged that she likes him more. I guess. I guess. That's what, a, what a terrible lesson for young girls out there. This whole show is a terrible lesson for young people. <laughs> Anime is terrible for young people. Anime is terrible for people. Anime is terrible. Anime. <laughs> All right. Are we... Uh, so, yeah. So, I said that this was my least favorite. I, I kind of feel as though every... All three chapters here. We we went back to the three-chapter format after kind of venturing outside of that last week. Right. And in addition, all three of these took place on campus. Um, you know, Except the, for a brief segment at the end of the first. Yeah, I guess. Wait. Was that not? Yeah, I guess they were in front of like a mall. Yeah, or they were something, in like the, city in the city center yeah. doing. Yeah, but they were all stuff. by and large. They were all set at the school. And yeah. over the past few weeks, we've been kind of you know like moving away from Shuchin Academy a little bit. Um, but they went back to it this time. So I mean, there's there's nothing really wrong with that. But the show has been messing with its formula, like tweaking it a little bit every every week, and uh, they seem to hit the hit the reset button a little bit with this one. But still, still, uh, you know, like a positive, fun type of thing, type yeah. of vibe going on. I agree with that. All right, how about, uh, let, let's see what time we're at. 38 minutes, damn. Maybe we can get this done in under an hour? I mean, we're about to talk about Confundo. I mean, Bacchano. Indeed. Uh, let, let's go ahead, let's go ahead and, uh, and move on to that series. So we'll actually just start with episode seven. Before we talk about episode eight, because it's it's all contained in the exact same two days in 1711 when the whole thing started aboard a ship that I didn't write the name down of because I'm not a smart man. The Advena Avis. That's right. Adv the Advena, Advena Avis. Avis or something. Okay, so, so how many characters did you recognize? Because obviously some of the characters aboard that ship are still alive and kicking. Four. Okay, were they Miza? Yes. Um, Coleslaw? Yes. Sizzle? Yes. And Elmer. Uh, Elmer, really? Uh huh. Who is he? The senator. Elmer's the senator. Yeah. In the at the very end of the episode, Miza and Elmer are talking to each other, and that's the senator. No, I don't think so, dude. Because Elmer had blue eyes. 
And the senator, I remember specifically thinking, who is that man that Misa is speaking to? He has golden eyes. What if he's the guy from the newspaper? I don't know. I thought he was a senator just by like the way the office looked and everything. I mean, that kind of makes sense because they were, after Misa leaves, he says something about, oh, Sizzlard, or however you say his name. Sizzlard, Sizzlard sounds totally wrong. Sizzle. Yeah. For some reason, I was I was writing down, I was like, oh, what was the name that we gave for him? And the only thing that came to my mind was Quiznos because of his last <laughs> name. Uh, well, Sizzle Quiznos. Well, you know, Quiz, <laughs> Quiznos used to be famous for, or maybe they still are, I don't know, for um, toasting all their subs. Like if you wanted a toasted sub, Quiznos was the place to go, I suppose. So, you know, the ingredients might be sizzling in there between the, the you know, the pieces of bread and the bun. So it's a, it's a logical step to make. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's possible that he's the senator. It kind of makes sense. But I was I was just looking for physical similarities um, between the, you know, the characters in the 1930s where the most the bulk of the show is set in the in the 1700s. And he didn't have the right eye color. Um, so then I thought about characters that it could possibly be in the present. Lad Russo. I don't think that Elmer is Lad Russo, but they both have blonde hair and blue eyes specifically. And there was one other character um, who I didn't write down, I guess. What about um, Nick? Jacuzzi's friend. Oh, yeah. The blonde the, hair. We don't see his eyes. They're typically kind of screwed shut like an anime he's style. Brock. Right. Uh, it could be him. It could be the guy from the newspaper, the blonde guy. Yeah. Um, there aren't that many blonde characters. I mean, there are, there are those that we just listed. Right. Plus probably a couple others we're not thinking of. Um, I don't know. Miria I, is a blonde. I feel like it's the senator just because yeah, of how maybe. much the senator is involved with everything. That's kind of weird, though, because the senator is a very... He seems to be a, be a very cold, calculating, self-interested character. Like, he doesn't particularly care that his wife and daughter are aboard the train. If they lose their lives, so be it. Yeah, but maybe that's like his sixth wife and daughter. Yeah, that's po it's possible. Because he's 200-something years old at this point. Right. It would be interesting to see how much characters have changed. Obviously, the potential for change over centuries for an immortal... Um, it's quite large. ...exists, yeah. Um, I definitely but, took But his, his character did seem to be like the most righteous amongst all the, the passengers on the ship. And maybe righteous isn't even the right word, but he seemed to have like a very positive, sort of easygoing um, philosophy. It's like, like there's still more than a 0% chance that we can change his mind. Right. Um, and he's given that one wish by the, by the devil. We as have he's, no as idea what it is. Right. I kind of feel as though that character might be the rail tracer. Elmer might have turned into the rail tracer if he's not the senator. Because like he, he would need extraordinary power to become whatever the rail tracer is. Um, and he's singled out as someone who gets one wish, like one additional wish um, from this devil character. Although, you know, thinking about it, the rail tracer could be that guy with the dark hair and the ponytail who's up in the crow's nest. Right. Um, and who's like, who we'll, the demon seems to have some sort of like shared outlook on humanity with. It's like, we'll yeah. have more opportunities to converse in the future. Yeah, it could be, could be him. That uh, might be the more likely candidate. Um, okay, so you saw you saw four characters. Yeah. Uh, who are they again? Miza, uh, Cheslaw, Sizzlard. And Elmer. And Elmer, right. I spotted one more. Greto. I think he's Jacuzzi. Greto? Yeah. The one who gets devoured by Sizzlard. Then how is he alive? That's my question. But I'm pretty sure that was Jacuzzi. Wait, so we know there's a homunculus. What do you mean? We know that Sizzlard managed to create a person. Ennis. Ennis. Yeah. Who's a homunculus. Right. So if he creates a person, say he just like makes a body somehow or whatever, mm -hmm. he can give thoughts and memories. What if right. he just puts it all back? Yeah, that's, I guess that's possible. Then it would just make a copy of what he used to be. Yeah. Maybe that's how Jacuzzi was, was formed. Um. But I'm, I don't know, I'm pretty confident that Jacuzzi, um, that Greto is Jacuzzi. I don't know about that. They have the same, same hair color, um, 
I, I kind of felt as though their facial structure was similar. And Jacuzzi has like, he, his, um, the performance, like the voice performance given by his Seiyu, his, his voice is kind of broken because he's, he's really emotional. He's like constantly on the verge of tears, which kind of masks his voice. Um, so that could explain the, the difference in tones between the two eras. And also I feel as though, do you remember the scene where Miza was, um, trying to convince Greto to give him like half of his, half of his memories, half of the, the, right, formula, half of the formula for the grand panacea. Um, and he was like, he was saying, no, no, I, I couldn't do that. I don't deserve it. Like and he just reminded me very much of Jacuzzi in that moment. He just seemed to be um, he lack, lacking in confidence and um, really emotional. Yeah. I I think I think that's Jacuzzi. I think uh, at least they're not the same person, let's say, if Jacuzzi is indeed a homunculus. But. That's an interesting uh, theory. I don't know if I subscribe to it, but I see what you mean. So I was trying to figure out who Sylvie is. Uh, I couldn't tell if they were lovers or brother and sister the girl yeah uh, I, I guess they were like in a relationship of some sort yeah i was trying to figure out who sylvie might be and i i thought to myself well maybe she's niece she didn't drink the elixir she right. we know she has it but we never saw her drink it i i think we know for sure that she drank it because there's a there's a very short um series of scenes where we see a bunch of characters from the ship who are living in modern day new york like it cuts to them one by one, and we see like a lounge singer with short white hair. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. So I remember her. what you mean. Oh, wait a minute. Now that I say that, that can't be niece because we know that she is a lounge singer in New York or wherever she ended up. Right. So I think she did drink it. Um, but because uh, we, we see her in the present, or I, I think the show means for us to infer that that's her in the present. But it's it's not nice, I guess. It's not nice, right? But that's how her name's spelled. But the characters say niece when they talk to her, when they when they say her name. Oh, okay. From what I remember. Okay, so those four characters for sure, plus you know, maybe jacuzzi. That's my crackpot theory. I feel as though there were more, maybe. There probably are, but we A, might not have seen them, or B, their appearances have changed so much that we just don't know what they look like anymore. Right. Now, here's, here's the one thing that uh, makes me think that there are, no other, there are no other characters who are still alive that we've seen so far. Is that the demon, the devil, whatever, that Misa communes with to get the, the formula for the Grand Panacea? Right. Um, the devil says specifically... Um, anyone who, anyone who drinks it can't use false names. Um, right. They have to use the correct name just so you can, guys can identify each other across the centuries. Right. Which by the way, can I just say that this demon that puts out all of these oh. hyper convenient rules for the show? Yeah. Like. All oh, right. Um, so you can absorb people and gain their knowledge and give it back, and you guys can't change names. What's the matter with that? What? What sort of deity that gives this ability to other people just goes, "Hey, no change in names." It's and start absorbing people. It th just it's, think about the Garden of Eden, dude. God gave uh, Adam and Eve this entire garden, but says, "Don't eat from that tree." Right, but it didn't say, all right, now your names can't change and you can absorb people's knowledge. No, but there, I it, think... It just, it felt like, one, the demon just, like, outlines it, just like, here are the rules, la dee 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 do. I don't... Just, it felt really, like, expository and just, like... That's not, that's not exposition. That's, well, that's, well, that's explanation. Because, right, but it was, it, it just explained, it's like, all right, so here's how this connects to the future. I think there's a long-standing tradition of Supernatural series having a bunch of rules that are imposed on the characters. They need to be explained in one way or another. Think about Death Note, to, to make another Death Note reference. Ryuk has to explain in detail how the Death Note works to light before he begins going on his killing spree. Like, you, if you're going to involve yourself in... If you're going to create a series with a bunch of immortal people who can like literally consume 
others through their through their right hands and and stuff. You need, I don't know, somebody needs to explain it, and all the better to explain it in an episode whose job it is to go back to the beginning. What I think would be interesting is, does this show work without knowing what happened on the ship? Um, if you removed every scene from that ship, does this show still make sense? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I haven't seen the whole thing, so I can't say for sure. But I think, I it, think so. I think it probably would. Like, which is you, why you, you just wouldn't it's... grasp the the magnitude of the um, the conflict between Miza and Sizzlard. Because it's, I feel as though really it's those two who are at the center of this whole power struggle. Right, but we have never, we haven't seen them face off at all. Right, but in I, the future. So I far. feel as though we probably will. Right, especially we, since we've seen this episode here. Probably, but I think if the show holds up without that episode, then it wasn't needed. Maybe, maybe. Um. Although, you know, Bacchino's uh, kind of narrative playfulness is showing you and telling you whatever it wants and, and leaving you to put together the pieces. Well, I mean, yeah, maybe maybe dedicating an entire episode to just this one this one moment in time, like only a couple days, kind of goes against the, the spirit of that, uh, that, like that thesis. Yeah, because the rest of the show spans three years, and then all of a sudden we jump back 220 Right. Well, this uh, this series was based off this based on rather. Um, the show was based on a series of light novels. So perhaps there was like one light novel or one section, like one um, lengthy section of one of these novels that detailed what happened in seventeen eleven. Right. And as it's an adaptation, they wanted to include that. I don't know. Um, yeah. I mean, maybe it would function perfectly, perfectly fine, or even better without this chapter. But I, all the same, I was interested. You know, I like um, origin stories. That's like one one sort of fiction that I that I really love. I do too. Like Batman Begins is one of my favorite movies, even though it's not the best of the trilogy. But I just I didn't like this. I was just like, mm. this seems way too convenient. See, it just it didn't feel like an origin story. It felt like an explanation for everything else. Rather than being like, oh, this is how this came about, just be like, oh, yeah, they're just trying to explain the rest of it. That's what it felt like. Mm. Okay. I can't say I had that reaction. I was I was mostly interested. Okay. Uh, so, we'll move on to episode eight here. Uh, should we? Is there anything else to say about... Oh, I, I did have one, one short uh, thing that I wanted to mention. Do you remember in, I, I think it was the very first episode when Cheslaw says, um, why did I give my real name? Yeah, because they he can't change his name. And if anyone who had been listening had heard him, it would have been like, oh, I know who you are. I know where you came from. Because mm -hmm. if he, he said he gave his real name. Right. And, and, he, and he thought to himself, why did I do that? Right. Because he knows that if another immortal happened to be on that train and was listening they would know it's him because yeah, but, he can't change his name. But you're you're saying he knows as though he made a conscious decision to give his real name. No, I mean, he knows he's like, I shouldn't have done that because... But even that doesn't make any sense. Why would he think to himself, I shouldn't have done that when he was on the, the ship and he knows he can't give a false name? It's not even possible. Why, why would he think point. that to himself? I don't understand that. Maybe, like, did he forget what the what the devil said? I don't know. That's a good point, though. Yeah. That that just struck me as like, like an you inconsistency. Cannot bear a false name. Why did I give out yeah. my real name? Yeah, I don't. I don't really. I don't really get that. But maybe he tried to give a false name, but he yeah. couldn't. It could be that like you can have the intent to give a false name, but it won't pass your lips. Like it'll be it'll be the real thing. Um, yes, yeah, anyway, that's interesting. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. Uh, the, the guy with the long hair on the, on the ship, he yeah. was kind of wearing like a blouse. I'm sure it was a normal, like a normal attire for, for men back in that time. Yeah. Um, but he had the long hair. I kind of feel as though he's a character who we know in the quote unquote present. Um, and his, like his face was masked 
by his hair. So that we wouldn't know who he is. Yeah, like that could have just been a, a decision on the the part of the character designer or the author who originally wrote him as having that long hair during that time period. Mm. Uh, so I, I tried a little bit to figure out who that could be, but I, I don't know who. I even thought it might be Isaac. But probably not. Yeah, I kind of doubt that. Speaking of Isaac. We got an Isaac and Miria episode again. Did they have another episode that was dedicated mostly to them in this fashion before? Yeah, I think so. Huh, I, I really I really don't. The first time that we saw them when they were they had like that giant time skip and everything like that. That Oh, I mean it was the first nine minutes. So that was like yeah. a lo- a large portion, but it wasn't the whole episode. This is the first yeah. time we've had essentially whole episodes dedicated to one specific either people or time. Right. We did have a lot of emphasis on Lad Russo, I think, in episode four, maybe, and then Jacuzzi in one of the one of the episodes, either five or six last week. <clears throat> Excuse me. Had a lot of time on screen. Um, but yeah, this was all about Isaac and Miria. Like the title of the episode, I think, was Isaac and Miria unintentionally spread happiness wherever they go. Something like that. Um, and we saw them in three different time periods. Um, one with Eve. Yeah. In, the, in 1930, I think, when yep. they, they rob her, her house. In order to stop her from being sad. Right. Which is what gets the feds on their tail, as we see at the very start of this episode, kind of as like the, you know, the intro. Uh, Chief, is this a joke? <laughs> no. No, it's not. So one with Eve. Um, then we see them like trying to cheer up Jacuzzi because, of course, he's... Always little, crying. Yeah, always crying. Always. <laughs> Tells him a story about three Chinese warriors. The Something about the three kingdoms. Yeah. Did you notice that they said they're often uh, symbolized by the snake, the snail, and the frog? That remind you of anything? The snake, the snail, and the frog. No. The Sanin in Naruto. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, And then the third character, time period, whatever, uh, was with Ennis. That was the aftermath of her saving them. Right. From Dallas and his goons. Um, And, you know, she's she's like, she says something about contemplating the weight of her sins. And they're... And they said to her, you know, just, just, uh, you've done one good thing. Yeah. That balances it all balances out. everything out. And that's kind of their, that's kind of their message to all of the characters. Like if you're, if you're going through a hard time, if you're, if you're sad or if you're convinced of your own, you know, your, your own worthlessness or your own sin or whatever term you want to use, whatever situation, um, applies just, uh, just, be happy, just do something good, just try your best, you know, and it'll, it'll all, it'll all balance out. Um, so they're, you know, they're like the, if there's a, a scale of, of characters in Bacchano, they're like the, on the highest end of the, the moral spectrum, I suppose. It's not very high. <laughs> yeah, I guess they're I guess. thieves. They're like literally wanted by the FBI. <laughs> <laughs> they're not exactly the, uh, I guess no character in Bacchano is really like, you know, good except for Eve. Yeah, Eve. There's, there's got to be another, right? They're all gangsters. Maybe. Yeah, <laughs> they're not good people. Yeah, but isn't there, isn't there somebody else? What about the, um, the? Well, no. I was gonna say the people at the very, very beginning of the series, um, the professor, or the, the vice president of the Daily Days. Speaking to that girl, Rita was her name, maybe? I don't remember. Okay. I was going to say, maybe, well, you know, maybe that girl is, she could also be another innocent, um, but. She's also not a title card character. Right. But she, and she also works for um, a newspaper, which is just a front for an information gathering organization whose members all carry guns. Right. So they to, can extort money from people for information. When, uh. No, I don't think that's the reason. I think it's just for safety because they know that, you know, gangsters are going to be in and out of there. Right. So they're not having uh, the, the, the most legal of businesses. 
Yeah, so she, Rita, or whatever that girl's name was, she's probably not uh, untouched. Just Eve, I guess. So far. I'm kind of curious about, because the everything that's happening on board the Flying Pussyfoot is happening in 1931, is that right? Well, yeah, it's one train ride. Yeah, so I'm I'm curious about what's going on with Eve, like why we're seeing so much of what's going on in 1932. I wonder what the purpose of that is, how it's going to tie back into everything else. And why Dallas is still being pursued. We know that he leaves behind the immortality stuff in 1930. Did we figure that out? Yeah, that's 30. So why are people still after him? I wonder. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I I mean, I have to imagine that that's going to be cleared up at some point because we do spend so much time. There are so many characters who spend screen time talking about Dallas and looking for Dallas. And then we get a whole bunch of Eve and... Even when we're just focusing on Isaac and Miria's random antics, some of it, you know, centers around that family. Yeah. Um, we also saw um, at the end when Eve escapes after everyone's asleep, one of the, not the Jenna words, but the Runeradas, like, looks out the door after she leaves and it's just kind of like, meh, and closes the door and yeah. just lets her go. It's the guy with the glasses. I think he's the one who's always snacking. Yeah. Um. I'm in, yeah, I'm kind of interested in like what his deal is because we saw him aid in the, um, the kidnapping last week. Yeah. But at the same time, he also lets her go. I kind of, I kind of feel as though in that scene, he, he, yeah, like you said, he goes, maybe not even meh. Maybe he like, just like, just wants that to happen and just kind of just lets it go. Maybe he's gunning for the guy above him's job, just doesn't like him and wants him to get, or he could be like an immortal and he has a much bigger role in the story than we can understand at this point. It's hard to say with this show. Yeah. He's maybe he's the guy with long hair. Maybe. <laughs> um, or maybe the guy with the long hair is hair the, is the rail tracer. Tracer. Yeah, I, don't know. I noted that, that Eve was allowed to escape by that guy. Um, yeah, but it's, it's interesting to, you know, to ponder the fact that he helped to kidnap her and now he's, he's letting her go. Maybe he, um, has a connection at that, um, the newspaper at the information brokers. Right. And they didn't want to give out that information. So he's like, well, at least I can fix this kind of. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because it was their fault that she got kidnapped. Right. Nicholas or, or whatever his name is. Um, I, I can't remember, but he, he lets it spill to, um, Gustavo, big deep voiced guy, right? That Dallas has a sister and that she can be found at this address and kidnapped and blah, blah, blah. So it could be that he's, you know, he works for them. Yeah. Yeah. He does seem, he's the character, he's the sort of character based on his, uh, his appearance and attitude who might, you know, he's, his, his shoulders are kind of hunched up like this. He's very quiet. He tends to express himself non-verbally, um, mostly by eating. So I can see him uh, working for the Daily Days. And they would need people inside. Yeah, to get that information in the first place. Yeah. All right. Any other thoughts, notes? I thought the episode on this ship, for the most part, There was so much like smoke and dark shots and haze. It was just like, this doesn't look very good. Yeah, that's, that's true. Um, definitely the, the limitations, the visual limitations of the series were felt most keenly in that episode. I feel, I I, I think a Blu-ray would also look better because it's like just a hyper compressed version of the show. I mean, I don't, you think we're watching Blu-ray rips? Well, not at full bit rate. Oh, when yeah. you lose bitrate, you lose color depth and you add noise and stuff like that. So an right. actual Blu-ray would look, you know, pretty good. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, it would it definitely would look less bad. Yeah, it would reduce some of the banding and would would, you know, add more color to, to some scenes. But still, the like the smoke and the haze that you're talking about, that was a decision on the, the part of the, the compositing team, probably. And they just, you know, they went, they went too far with it. Yes. Plus there's a, they may have been trying to mask some CG 
in those scenes. We already know that CG is heavily involved in the train, the tr everything, not everything that happens on the train, but a good deal of it. Um, now the ship being a, a location that's only uh, central to one episode, probably it, it does look like it was drawn. Yeah. I didn't, it wasn't like glaringly obvious. Hey, this is CG and wood looks pretty bad in CG. It does, but you could cover that up um, with some, you know, with some fog. That's true. Lots of fog. And it, 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 it wasn't necessarily CG. That's just speculation on my part. It, it could just be that they wanted to mask the, you know, the terrible hand-drawn ship. Or yeah, who knows? You know, the deck. Maybe that part wasn't looking too good. Or they could have just, you know, gone too hard on the, on the effects. Right. Too much style. Mm -hmm. Any anything else? I know you weren't a you weren't a fan of the, the the ship episode, and I I do think the series could function without it. Um, although we'll we'll see. You know, we we still got six episodes left plus the the three OVAs. Yeah, the three OVAs. Wait, yeah. really? No, five episodes left plus the three. Yeah, OVAs. okay. We'll see when we Halfway get to the end. Halfway there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Are, are we are we done? Are we done for the uh, week? there was there was one thing I wanted to mention about like the difference between Kaguya and Neverland's use of music. Okay. Cause like Neverland uses this like really dramatic music when two ten year olds are talking two twelve year olds are talking to each other about like who betrayed each other and stuff like that. Yeah, in life or death circumstances. And then Kaguya uses the same kind of like epic music to describe the inner monologue of love struck teens. Yeah. So I just think it's really interesting how they can use the almost exact same style of music for two completely different effects. One to add to the absurdity and the other to attempt to make something more dramatic. Right. I just thought that was interesting. Yeah, it is. Um, whether whether or not you feel as though it's appropriate has to do with how much you buy into each series, I think. Yeah. Although there's there's always the the editing to consider. Like we talked about last week, Neverland's editing with the music, sometimes they just let it run. Um I didn't I didn't notice any like, you know, glaring problems with that this week, but I also I was also kinda kind of sleepy. Yeah. I noticed. For Neverland. Since you forgot part of the end. Yeah. Well, I, I recalled it all as you as you said it back. Yeah. You want to do the the rankings? Are you gonna do that? Sure, let's do that. What was your uh what was your least favorite this week? Neverland. Neverland as well. Kaguya in the middle. Yep. Mob at the top. Yep. Same here. Oh yeah. It's easy with three series. Yeah, it is. Normally, by this point, we would have dropped Neverland because it's just dead last every week. I actually, yeah, well, we, back when we were doing this podcast earlier, we were covering five shows at a time and there was usually one that we both didn't like very much. Um, but with three, it's, it's just easy to keep going, you know, like the only other, there are, there are a few other series that I'm watching this season and I guess now would be an okay time to talk about them. Uh, I'm not actually going to. The only one that I could see us replacing Neverland with is Dororo. Um, I'm not caught up on that, but after three episodes, it was it was pretty good. But the thing is, like with Neverland, the greatest sin that anime can commit for me is being boring. And although I was kind of tired uh, while I was watching Neverland, it, it was more because like you know I have to I have to get up at 5 a.m. for my for my job, and like I come home, I was I'm on my feet for seven hours. I come home and it's like. I'm just, I'm just tired, you know? Yeah. And watching TV just is, your brain is practically off. Yeah. You're relaxing. Um, I like Neverland. The, the worst thing an anime can do is be boring. And Neverland is not boring to me. Um, I don't, I don't think it's a great series or anything, but it doesn't bore me. I don't think. Like uh, okay. I'm kind of curious about you know what's gonna happen next. Are they are they gonna escape? What's you know what's what's going on with Ray and Norman? Who's gonna who's gonna emerge as like the, the top dog? Um, when is Emma gonna stop being so dumb and thinking that they can get literal five year olds out of a like a prison? Oh oh oh, younger than five. They have a they have a baby now. Oh yeah, they have a literal one year old. <laughs> yeah. 
They uh, have literally people who play Fortnite. <laughs> okay. Uh, aren't they all in the Fortnite demographic? Like the oldest kids are 12. I guess so, yeah. We got a Fortnite reference in, guys. That means our podcast is over. Instant views. Thanks for watching. All right, we'll, we'll be back next week. See you later. Real shit.